Brothers and sisters, our father knows where we are, doesn't he? And uh, the second epistle of Paul to Timothy. Let's, let's listen here. The reason we're doing this is that Paul is not happy with Timothy. And we need to read this. He's just saying, stop moaning. I know you don't like being in prison, but God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. But he's actually challenging him and saying, Paul, your condition is inconsistent with your profession of faith. Your condition is inconsistent with your profession of faith. Your condition is inconsistent with what your profession of faith is. And what a challenge for us this morning. Your condition, says Paul, is inconsistent, Timothy, as a soldier of Jesus Christ, with your profession of faith. You claim to have believed the gospel, but you are in a spirit of bondage. You are fearful. You are unhappy. And Timothy, you are wrong. Now, nobody says that when they say, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and sound mind, self-control, discipline. Paul is telling Timothy off. And I don't mind being corrected by the Lord, do you? But I think that's our challenge. Our, how, it, is our condition on a regular pumping of the heart, moment by moment, second by second, consistent with our profession of faith? Or... Oh, I speak to people all the time, and you do. And you can see that their condition is not consistent with their profession of faith, and I hear them pray the prayers. But we've got to live the life, and that's the challenge today. So this is not my words, it's a lot of, can you smile at me, Paul, and I'll know you're happy. <laughs> yes, bravo, brother. Hallelujah. Bravo, brother. Okay, so we'll start in verse 1. Should we read it together, please? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ. Life in Christ Jesus. There's a life to be lived in Christ. There's a life to be lived in Christ. To be happy, you've got a response. He's smiling. <laughs> Responsibility to be happy with the life in Jesus. To Timothy, and look what he says. My, my beloved son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. He's getting ready to tell him off. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. I can say this word because I constantly remember you, you constantly remember me, and we've had a lot of communications going on, even more so with Cherishers, 2018. So we kind of know each other enough to be able to correct each other, help each other. Would we agree? Yes. It's very impressive how he starts with my yes. Grace and, mercy. and he says, I'm going to operate grace with you now. Yes. yes. And yeah. Yes. And he says, verse 4, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. And here he goes. He knows him. He knows him. And the Lord Jesus Christ knows us. For I am mindful of the sincere faith. So he's saying, you've got sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. And here we go. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Oh, you're not on fire, Timothy. That Greek word means... Ashes, too many ashes over the fire, and it needs the breath to blow on it that it might roar again. Makes the, f the word kindle afresh. I'm gonna, it's a, in your strongs, we're going to be looking at it in a moment. It means to be fervent, to be revived. And it's a strong 329. We will look at it in a moment. Look what he says. He says, I'm reminding you there's a fire lit inside of you. Jesus Christ gave his life for you Amen. and I laid my hands on you and then he goes for God has not given us Timothy a spirit of timidity which is cowardice stop being cowardly says Paul to Timothy be brave have courage 
believe, trust, but of power, love and discipline. And I've written there, discipline is self-control. How many of you have been frightened to death last week? You've had something that's suddenly... Oh, if we're honest. If we're honest, June, yes. We're honest. We've all... Oh, my word, how am I going to deal with this? Oh, or I didn't want that to happen. We, we, we've all got like that, if we're honest. Yeah. Most of us, as they say, most of us... But anyway, there, then he goes. He's saying, you're not quite right. Therefore, look what he's saying. You've got to kindle afresh the gift of God. You've got the gift of God in you because God hasn't given you a spirit of cowardice. Be brave. Do things for Jesus. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner. But look what he says. Join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. You see, really, we are suffering because of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we deny ourselves, when we feel like giving in, but we don't, when we smile, when we don't feel like smiling, that's because we're commissioned by Christ to proclaim good news, to, to walk by faith. I don't feel well, but I'm going to thank the Lord for my body. I don't feel well, but I'm going to give thanks unto God that he's working all things together for my good. That's how I believe, isn't it, that we're to be. He says, who has saved us and called us with, you have been, way, Julie, you've been called, folks. You've been called by God. You have been called by God. Not according to our works. That's good news, isn't it? How many, does he, how many do enough? None of, us. None of us. But accord, you see, he's got his own purpose in calling you. But according to his own purpose and grace. Purpose and grace. We're not to be depressed like the world, folks. We're not to be frightened. We're not to be miserable. We're not to be mardy. We're not to be cutting. We're not to be sarcastic. We're not to be selfish, careless. Because you've got a holy calling on your life. Which was granted or is granted us in Christ Jesus. When? Recently? <laughs> From all eternity. Amen. Before I was on the earth, I was Christ's. So were you. Amen. And I was given to God the Father by Jesus Christ. Thine they were. John 17. Thine they were. And you have given them to me, Father. And now I give them back to you. From all eternity, you've got a purpose and a plan for your life. How does that make you feel? Pardon. Amazing. Wonderful. Amazing. But now has been revealed. How is this purpose revealed? By the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Where? How? Through the gospel. That's the good news if you never hear anything again. And then he says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. And then <laughs> he's the responsibility. For this reason, I also suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Are you convinced that he is able to guard what you have entrusted to him until that day? Yes. yes. Whatever it is. Then he says, you have a responsibility now. Can you see the word retain in verse 13? Actually, in the Greek means hold the example. Hold the example of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. God, how? How do you guard these sound words? Through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you, the Holy Spirit of God is our treasure. And he has been given to us that we would live a life higher than anyone could ever dream or imagine. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are, um, should we say, figureless, <laughs> 
and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Anisiphorus. For he, that means prophet bringing. That man was given a name which means prophet bringing and he brought blessing to Paul. So that man, when he was born, his parents must have been supernaturally moved by God, that's what I believe, to give him the name Onesiphorus. Because, yes, because it means bringing advantage or bringing profit or profit bringing. And what does Paul say? This man ordained by God to be born to such a name, he has refreshed me. That's the will of the Father. You're given a name and you've got like years ahead of you. You're going to go and you're going to minister to the Apostle Paul when he's in chains. And you'll be given a name, bringing advantage. And people will read of you thousands of years on and they will look and they will think, how great is our God. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly said, I want to be a prophet bringer. Do you? Yeah. I want to bring advantage to the people I deal with in my life. I want to go eagerly searching for those who are in chains and help them in some way. I can't do all of it, but I can do some of it. You can do some of it. He searched for me and he found me. Hallelujah. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered to me at Ephesus. Now, because we've got these great Bibles, just, just have a look what Paul is saying, 329 to Timothy. He's been admonished, isn't he? It's the beginning of a new year, folks. That old enemy will try and get you on the same problems as you had last year, won't he? And you're going to go forward into this year and you're going to say, I am going to have the bearing upon me of the words in which I believe. My condition is going to speak this word. We can see the word there, 329, is Annas Opereo. Can you see? And it says it's page 2095. Yvonne, do you want to borrow a Bible like that one? No, I'm all right. I'll just keep it. Okay. Um, it's um, a compound from the base of two. You're going to love all these words, folks. This is Paul, the apostle, not a woman, to make you feel even better, speaking to a young soldier and he's... You're not what you say you are. You're frightened. You've got to get rid of fear in your hearts. And look what it says. What does it say? It says, from 303 and a compound of the base of treble two six, treble four two. What does it say? To re-enkindle. Stir up the gift. Stir up. Stir up the gift. And from that, go to 2226. You want to know where the word fire comes in? So we go to 2226. We should be on fire and then we'll have some snakes come out and get us. And I'll tell you what happens. Because people don't like the snakes, they don't like the fires. Mm. They just think I'll float through, trying to stay under the radar. The enemy won't get me then. Well, he will, but it won't be quite so glorious. It's a wonderful thing to, to have a satanic attack because it just means you're alive. Satan doesn't bother with cemeteries. 2226. Can you see that lovely word? Zoon. Have you got it? A derivative of 2198. It means a live thing. You're to be alive. A noun from Zeus, a living creature to be alive. And from there you go to 44426. 44426. Is it 444? Oh, no, it's not. It's 444, 4442, okay? Have a look at this. It, it's the word poor, P-U-R. Look what it means, folks. Fire. Who said fire? Me. Rodney, fire. Literal or figurative, it gets better then. So he says fire, but especially lightning. Alison prayed about Barak today. His name, isn't it, is lightning. It's the word and the fire. And it means fire, literal or figurative, especially lightning in the Greek, fiery fire. And it says that word there, look, if you go down to 4445, because they're all from the same, it means to be on fire. And then he says, i.e. special to have a fever or be sick of a fever. But Paul isn't speaking of that. But he's saying... 
Stir up the gift. Let's just go back to, to, to Timothy, please. He's saying it, it actually means keep in full flame, Timothy. Keep in full flame. Flies don't land on a hot stove. Stay alive. Stay. Um, isn't that? So verse six. For this reason, I remind you to stay, to kindle afresh, to keep a full flame. Keep in full flame the gift of God. It actually means, a, it comes to, to do with the word ashes laid on a fire that needs to be stoked again and the wind blow upon it. Go to Matthew 3, please, verse 11. Does anybody feel like they're on fire today? Yeah. Huh? Do you do now. I know you do, darling. And that's, this is so, this could be just for you, my sweetheart. I'm just going to explain to you how to stay on fire. Fire. It was it. Uh, it's Matthew 3, verse 11. Matthew 3, verse 11. What he's actually saying is, stir up the gift, be bold, get going, and go for it. Go for it, Timothy. You've got nothing to lose. You've got the power of God inside of you. You've been called upon by God to go and preach this message of good news. Matthew 3, verse 11. And it's put John the Baptist speaking. As for me, I baptise you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's exactly what Tim Paul is saying to Timothy. The Holy Spirit, the treasure of God has been imposited, deposited inside of you, but you have to stir it up by faith. You have to believe by faith. doesn't matter what the situation is. You're just expected by God to believe by faith, to believe. You see, Paul, Tim, just go to 1 Timothy, please. 1 verse 16. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. It's very important to remember there are two things to do. You've got to keep this fire in full flame, Holy Spirit and fire. And people say, I have the Holy Spirit. And you can say, where is the fire? The first epistle of Paul to Timothy, just start off here, look, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. To save sinners. Among whom, he says... I am foremost of all. And then he continues. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal. Immo Say it. Jesus Christ is immor eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, and honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, Paul is actually saying here, my, my example is um, that I am the worst of sinners, he's saying. I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason, so he's saying we're operating and living under mercy. That Jesus... <laughs> This really helps me, doesn't you? Take it slow. Paul can be a bit miserable at times, but it is understandable. But you can, can't you, Paul? You get very fed up, don't you? Yeah. And he's in a terrible position. You're in a terrible position, aren't you? You are. And I completely understand, but more than that, God understands. So God has introduced you to us that we might help you. Okay. We're not much good, Paul, but we've been called by God to love you. Does that make you feel better? Because he's actually saying here, we're all sinners. We, none of us are any better than each other. None of us. We all need mercy, even the doctor, Rodney. Needs mercy. <laughs> yeah. Paul is saying it's all about sinners finding mercy, this walk. Sinners finding mercy. In a, why? What? You read it with me. Yet for this reason, verse 8, I found mercy. Why? Is anyone too hot? Yes. 
Yes, sorry. I found mercy. Now, isn't this amazing that the migrants are all coming over the channel because of the mild weather? Pardon? The lack of wind. But God has chosen this day for us to live and they're coming over. And I didn't know, but apparently once they put them through that tent, they allow them to go as long as they report to an immigration centre. But there's no one there to pick them up and take them there. So they just actually absorb themselves into society. And so we've got the Muslim on holiday in Africa who's called it a major incident but has not come <coughs> back, but actually is coming back today. Isn't that amazing? What Everything, brothers and sisters, is falling down. Every system that you think you can rely and trust in, it's falling apart. It's falling apart. Once they've gone off there and checked that they haven't got hypothermia, they're free to go. And Macron is only supporting the Paris Accords. I know. Which is interesting. Yes, yes. Is it, do you not find this amazing? It's amazing, isn't it? Today, they're busy squirrelling their way, and I understand why they would want to come. They're coming from Iran through Serbia, aren't they? From Iran into Serbia. But look, are they coming here to get saved? That is the perfect plan of God, if he's moving them around, ultimately. Well, they're coming, and God hasn't given a red light yet. They're on their way. We're going to be challenging every area of our thoughts, but there's one thing we need to know today. Who called us? Fit. From when? From the beginning. From eternity. from eternity. We were all here. He saw us. Isn't that wonderful? And then he says, yet for this reason, but I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost chief of sinners, he calls himself, Jesus Christ might demonstrate what? Perfect patience. Which means we've got a responsibility to also demonstrate perfect patience with each other. But you see, God's patient with us. He doesn't want anyone to, to die. He wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. But God's patience and glory is demonstrated by having sinners such as us. What a humbling thought that is. As an example for those who would believe in, isn't that wonderful? God is not looking for perfect people, but he's looking for people who will acknowledge that his son came to die for them. And then God will do the work by the Holy Spirit, which is why Paul is saying to Timothy, stir up the gift, kindle it afresh, be set on fire with the fire that God has given to you, Holy Spirit and fire. And uh, that word, their example, all the Jewish people, Midrash, everything is all about example. Let's just turn to that, please. 5296. It comes from the word tupos, ultimately. The, the tabernacle was a pattern. The feasts were a pattern. The mercy of God is a pattern. Is there anybody outside of God's mercy today? Is there anybody outside of God's mercy? No. No one. And when we do wrong and when we get it wrong and we do, we're able to come and we can say, Father, in the name of your son, would you please forgive me? Can you see that? 5296, hupo tuposis, which means a sketch, a form, a pattern. And from there, you go to 5259. 5259. And 5179. Go to 5259. That means under, isn't it? A primary verb meaning under. We go from there to 5179, and here it is. What does that mean when they're called? 5179. It means tupos, T-U-P-O-S. We all know this from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's a prototype, a pattern. Are we to be merciful? Yes, we are. Are we to have mercy in our hearts when we see these people coming over on these boats? Yes. We are. We are to, yeah. yeah. They're going to be a drain on every system going on. But the Lord said, that's we've just read from Paul, if we take it literally, he's patient with us. We must be patient with all. 
And 5179, it means a stamp, a scar, a style, a resemblance, a sampler, a type, a prototype, if you read down. Just go down, down to the second B section, spoken figuratively of an example, a pattern to be imitated. So this is a man who's received mercy. And he's saying that God giving mercy to me reveals to the world he's a patient God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He's a pattern for all, but also he's a pattern that as Paul suffered, as Timothy suffered, we will suffer in some way for our faith. And we can see that coming is really easy. Do you think you can see that coming? Yeah. Two things I thought of Carol this morning. Number one, Carol, know that when fear comes to you, it is not from God. Okay? And number two, you have got to know, you've got to have a full understanding of what God has given you. So from the scriptures we've looked at this morning, fear is not from God. There's a healthy fear from God, but fears that come on you and frighten you, they're not from God. That The spirit of fear coming on you is not from God. So you immediately have the answer. The answer is a knowledge of the scriptures. Okay, that's the answer. So we're sitting here today, and what have you learned today? Is Paul speaking to Timothy and saying to him, you need to, you've got the gift, you've got the light, you've got the fire, but what have you got? It's got to be stirred up. Kindle it afresh, stir it up, be alive. That, and that's what's happening, isn't it? Today, you're stirring it up. So first of all, in, when you're on your own, the fear is never from God. So if it's never from God, what do you do? You resist it. And what do you resist it with? The same as Jesus when he was tempted, you resist it with the word of God. Which brought me to the thought, of this. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 4, please. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 4. You see, the best people to talk to, I think, well, I like everybody, but I love talking to people about the Word of God. I love talking to people about the Word of God, don't you? The challenge is this, Psalm 4, verse 4. Song of Solomon, sorry. My question today is this, is your neck adorned with shields? Your neck in scripture is your character. When do you use a shield? In a battle. If you have been through a battle, brothers and sisters, your neck will show it. Your, your neck, it means your character, okay? I have got a, I want a neck adorned with shields, the same here. As Solomon is expressing his love for the bride. It's a type of Jesus in love with his church. And we get down, look, to verse four. Your neck, so your character is like the tower of who? David. David. So when we look at David, we're thinking Jesus, built with rows of stones. But in the margin... Look what it says. Somebody read it out to me, please. Oh, an arsenal for an arsenal. An ar and what's an arsenal, David? Oh, it's a room full of rifles, guns, bombs, incendiary devices, arrows, everything. That's what he's saying my character is. You're full of bows, arrows, guns, bombs, everything. War engines that Hezekiah did. I'm full of battle. But have I got anything to show I've been in a battle? How do you know I've been in a battle? How, if you knew me, how would you know Julie's been in some battles? Not because I look rough, but how else would you know that I... Because I give grace and mercy. By the way you live. By the way that I live. My neck. Now, so what I'm trying to say... What about your scars? Yes. He lost them so far, he had no wound this day. He did, he did, and, and that's right. I bury my body, that those scars. That's favourite scripture you wrote to me in 1918. Yeah. Can he have travelled far who has no wound or scar? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that is because for someone to be merciful, that's what Paul's saying. I recognise that I'm a sinful man, I've received mercy. And yeah. God giving me mercy reveals to the whole world that he's patient. Does that make you, how does that make you feel at the end? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you're not only patient with me, but you're patient 
with all mankind. It's not your will that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. So our attitude to anything in everybody is very different. No matter who it is we're involved with, we must operate with patience. But how I wanted us to look here this morning is if you, if you look, he says, your neck, so that's your character, is like the tower of David. The word, I won't get you to turn to it because I know we're taking time. I know you're going to be quick today. I believe that, I believe that it's, the, the number to write near neck is 6677. But it actually means to bend your neck to take a burden. Not to be haughty. To bend your neck. It's 667 from 6696. And it means to bend the back of your neck. Six six seven seven to six six nine six to bear a burden. It means by bending your neck. That means you're stooping down. You're helping. You're not haughty. That's 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 not a good sign. But you're going to stoop. It actually means that to bend the back of the neck so that someone can lay their burden on it. We're to bear one another's burdens. It is, and the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. But it's the warfare, because Paul goes on and says, because of this, Timothy, you are to fight the good fight of faith. You are to wage. It's all about soldiers and about battles. But in the description of the bride, your character is like the Tower of David. David means beloved. Your, your character is basically beloved or lovely, built with an arsenal. That means you've got the ability to fight the enemy when he comes with the fear. On which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. The word tower here in verse four, your neck is like the tower of David. Tower here means a pulpit. It means that word, um, a bed of flowers. It actually means an armory, something tall. It's an arsenal built for weapons. On which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. And the word here, um, mighty, that really spoke to me this morning because the word mighty men, the word mighty is gibor. And where do we get El? Who is El Gabor? Where do we find El Gabor in the Bible? In the it's Isaiah nine. Let's just turn Isaiah nine verse six. Yes, yes, yeah. So Isaiah nine. So what we're doing today, um, friends, is we're looking in the Word of God. So when the enemy comes, we know it's not God. And we have enough understanding of the word, even learning today again. I am likened to um, an arsenal of weapons. Whose weapons are they? The weapons of our warfare. They are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Devil, go down in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that true? So in Isaiah 9, verse, start at 6 and 7, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And let's just say verse 7 is a declaration. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Say it slowly. No, no, well, think of where we're heading. Think of Russia. Think of what's going on today. Think of Erdogan in Turkey. Think of the chaos. Think of Donald Trump reversing the new world order right now. You see, and people are coming out, Mueller's coming out and said, this man is destroying the new world order in America. He's actually turning around. So what's going to happen? How on earth has he not been assassinated? But the stronghold of the Lord. But we've been chosen to live in those days. But if you read it slow, any, any man in history who has tried to do anything gets, an, gets, assassinated. gets assassinated. They have. 
Yeah. Kennedy. Yes. Finally, God was raised. Yes. 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 If he is the Cyrus for them. If he is the Cyrus for the Jews. We're living in these days, brothers and sisters. Yes. But yeah, if, if we read it there, you see, now what we're saying is we're coming yeah. to the barley loaf that's thrown into Gideon's dream. It's going to overturn everything. The barley loaf is exactly the same as the, as the mountain and the stone that crushes the um, symbol of Daniel, the Nebuchadnezzar. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's where you're going to live, Paul, for 1,000 years upon the earth. His government will never end. It will never end in your life or ours. But his government is going to come upon this earth. And his government, there will be no end of his government or of peace. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So the description of the Messiah, mighty there next to counsellor, is exactly the same word. That is where you get the word gibor, G-I-B-B-O-R. And if we just go back to Song of Solomon for a moment. Gibor, it means powerful. It means by implication, a warrior, a champion. The Messiah shall be born to you. He'll be a warrior. A champion. So what's the bride of Jesus likened to? She's got all the warrior's armory on. She's got the arsenal. She's got the power. We're the only ones who can help the people who are depressed, brothers and sisters. And where's the necklace of righteousness? You've got it, you see. Yeah. So You've got it. Yes. Yes, that's in Song of Solomon. I've got a ring at home and it's, that's, that's exactly what the scripture is. What we're trying to say today is you are not to be surprised that you're in a fight. Who's in a fight? We are. We are in a battle. But the battle, as we know, we know it. It belongs to the Lord. But then I thought, how wonderful there. He's saying all the round shields of the Gabor men. Do you understand? We are not in any battle alone. It's with the Lord. Now, if you just go for a moment to Song of Solomon 7 for a moment, please. Love it. Pardon? Love it. Love it. I want Carol to be strong in the Lord and in the power of her might. And you are, aren't you? David is... This tower, by the way, protrudes. David's tower protrudes from the king's house. We are attached continually uh, to the Lord in every battle we're in. Isn't that true? Amen. Okay, let's go to Song of Solomon 7, please. He's speaking to her again, and he says in verse 4, he says, now, look what's happened here then. You've gone from having all the shields of Gabor hung around your neck. You've gone now, oh, look what's happened. Your neck is like, okay, so what's happened to her? She's gone through some battles. She's gone through some battles now. She knows what death is. I'm talking of death to self. That's what I want, but that's what I can't have. That's what I'd like, but I know it's not your will for me. This will cost me if I give it, but I'm going to give it. Anything you do for Jesus is costly. You've got to die to self. Isn't it wonderful, the process of God's word? But the admiration. Christ sees that the neck has gone from the battle raging to at the moment you've got a neck of death. There have been battles and you have given in. You have allowed my will to be in your life. Let this mind be in you, which is in Jesus. He goes on, he says, your neck is like a tower of ivory. But your eyes have now become like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabin. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon, which faces Damascus. Damascus, heavens above. So when you get to this bit here, um, your, uh, your neck is like, a, your eyes are like pools. Now something's had to happen in your eyes. Something has happened had to happen to your eyes. Your eyes have had to see a victory. Do you, you need know, to hang your battles 
Keep your finger there and go to Ezekiel 27 for a moment, verse 11. You become valiant. And because, but you, the war has brought the death of self. 27, 11. This is the lament over Tyre. But look what shields do. Look what shields do. She, you don't have a shield. You're in a battle today, aren't you? Just to sit there. You're in a battle. I understand. I appreciate. God appreciates and understands. You're in a battle. But you're in your shame. Is here. Yes. Hallelujah. And nobody can take it away. But we can continue to help each other to be faithful. That's what we're to do. We've got to continue to help each other to be faithful. Verse 11. This is a lament over Tyre. When it says, the sons of Arved and your army were on your walls all round and the Gamadin were in your towers, they hung their shields on your walls all round. Yes, your arsenal. This is the enemy, Tyre. But the the Tyre's going to bring the gifts to the Messiah in Psalm 45. But what does it say? Those, what does it say the shields did? They perfected your beauty. Can you see that? They hung their shields on your walls all round. Why does somebody hang their shields on the wall all round? They perfected your beauty. Hey, you've been in a battle, brother, sister. I can see it. You're looking lovely. There's something about you. Why? Because in that battle, what did you find? Any battle that you have really been in, what did you find? The love, the goodness, the grace, the mercy of Jesus. You know, when I went in the Korea service, I had a bear swimming and the water was about here. And he says, you, oh, Lord, keep my head above the water because it looked like the, the bear was going under, but the bear didn't go under. But to show you've been in a battle, perfects your beauty. And that's what that's what Jesus is looking at there. But he says here, your neck is now like a tower of ivory. It's got many shields on it as well. But your eyes are like pools. That word there, fish pools. That word there, it says, your eyes are like pools. It actually means fish pools. It's from a word meaning to bless. How can your eyes be a blessing unless you really know the depth of Jesus Christ? Yes. No, it's true. Your eyes are like the fish pools. There's life. There's got to be life behind those eyes, brothers and sisters. Jeremiah says, Looking at you, death is coming through your gates. You can look at some people and there's just death behind their eyes. True, isn't it? You've got to be life like you got new eyes, didn't you, out in the Jordan? Life. Do you feel you're alive? Pardon? Yeah. Are you stirring up the gift? Are you physically tired? No. <laughs> I'm trying to help you out here. Okay. Okay. But uh, this is... It is. It is. No, it is. It's more beautiful, isn't it? it says. That's exactly what they're doing. Yes, rows of stones. Every shield is a beautiful. Every shield is like the breastplate. Like every everything shows. It's much afraid going up the mountain. It's a statement. It wasn't like this when I started, but look what he's done with me now. It is Barrett with the glittering sword. And the, word, the, the, the number you need there to find fish pools is 12951288. And it means a resting place where camels kneel down to drink water. Your camel is the dirty creature that got into the ark that likes its own way, but can carry water across a desert. But your pools are to be a place that someone else's filth will lie down and rest. And I mean that. You can be in the presence of a dirty man or a dirty woman who's committing sexual sin or violence or filth. Your eyes can be a place of blessing for them because they might arouse within them a hope, a hope that there is a way of escape, a hope that this person knows Jesus who delivered them, who can deliver, who if they've, somebody's got to know that you are walking in the victory of Christ. And if you are walking in the victory of Christ, you can introduce them to Jesus Christ as well. But there's no point walking around like this and then saying, how great is our God? How great is his name? How lovely are the feet of my Savior who brought me good news? Unless you mean it. The enemy is trying to get us to shut up. It's going to be cast. 
there's going to be, do you want to cut? Do you want it to cost? It's the only way I'm going to get a neck of ivory and I'm going to have lovely things around my neck is through these battles with the flesh, the world, the flesh and the devil. I'll take it. Amen. I'll take it. Because I want my eyes to be fish pools. They're far away, but I want them to be fish pools in the marketplace. But I want to show you this lovely thing. Your eyes will be like fish pools where that ugly camel of stubbornness will lie down and take a rest. You know, she, that's the only time she got off is when she saw Isaac. Your eyes are like the pools in Heshbon. What is Heshbon then? It means reasoning, the world's reasoning. The world won't ever reason. The world, what's the biggest thing they've said, Alec, to us about uh, cherishers? What's the biggest comment that they've made about us? Um, that you can't be outcrazy, and... That what they're saying is that you would give up your Christmas day yeah. Yeah. that everybody slavishly loves because it's a switch-off day serve. to serve. That is it. That is it. That, that's what everyone said. I never even thought about that, Alison, did you? No. We just got here and woof, let's go. It was here. We, we finish here, Numbers 21. Numbers 21 is the clue of Heshbon. Heshbon was the city of one of the biggest enemies of Israel, Sihon, Sion and Og. That's the type of the, of the beast out the sea and the beast off the earth at the end days. It's Numbers 21, verse 26. The her I've got fish pool eyes of Heshbon, from Heshbon. For Heshbon was the city of Sion. This is the behemoth and the Leviathan, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and had taken all his land out of his hand as far as the Arnon. But you see, look at the victory here. Just go to verse 21. Look at verse 6 first. The bronze serpent is the type of the cross of Jesus Christ. Anyone who's been bit by a snake can look and live. Yes. When you've looked and lived, and in verse 16, you have found the well of water. Look at Beer, verse 16. Assemble the people after they've been to Calvary that I may give them water, which is exactly what's going to happen to the remnant of Israel. Then they're going to sing a song, just as the remnant of Petra will do. By the way, did you see the places where we're staying in the desert on TV? Yes, the travel man. Yeah. On the travel man. Do you see them? The yes. yeah. yeah. We're going in Sun City in the Jordan Desert. Well, it's, it's on the TV. It's yeah. the travel man 48 hours. Yeah. Before, yeah. On yeah. yeah, you get one all to yourself. So that's... Oh, there's quite a few, isn't there? Yeah. But you see this? You get, yeah. And he says, this is what we're to do. And he says, you're to spring, sing, spring up, oh well. Then you go into verse 18, the well which the leaders sank, which the peoples of the people, the nobles, that's us, the people we digging today with the scepter and with their staffs. And from the wilderness, they continue to matinar. And then you come down to verse 21. What does it say just above it? Two victories. Well, don't forget, you've got the beast from the earth and the beast from the sea at the end. Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites. Remember, let me pass through your land. We will not turn off into a field or vineyard. We will not drink water from the wells. We will go by the king's highway. And so we pass through your border. Sion would not permit Israel to pass through his border. So Sion gathered all his people, went out against Israel in the wilderness and came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Israel struck Sion with what? The edge of the sword. You, when you strike the enemy that's coming to you with the edge of the sword, it's a memory of Song of Solomon. That's how you get eyes with life in them because you've seen the enemy give you, vi the Lord give you victory over the enemy. And they took possession of this land from the Arnon to the Jabbok as far as the sons of Ammon. For the board of the sons of Ammon was Jazer. Israel took all these cities and Israel lived in all the cities of the Amorites in Heshbon and in all her villages. After that, you look at verse 33. Then they turned and went up by way of Bashan and Og, where you get the word ogre from. The king of Bashan went out with all his people for battle at Edre. Og means long necked. We're talking of a neck that's to be adorned 
with battle shields for beauty. We went into a battle because we trusted the Lord and we've come out of the battle. Isn't it amazing one of the two enemies of Israel, the one, Og, it's a type of Babylon, the woman, because he's got a great big iron bed. That's all that's known about him. He's long-necked. We don't want to be long-necked. And we don't want to finish with this man. Proverbs 29, verse 1. This is a man who hardens his neck. It's the opposite of somebody who will actually bend the neck and take the burden. You see, that's what... By the way, the name Sion meant sweeping off refuge of scouring. It means the world doesn't want to hear what the Lord says. It's, it means reasoning, considering God's wisdom to be off scouring, not interested. How many people in the world would be interested in this? Hardly the Christians are. I am. I want some fish in my eyes. Do you want some in yours? Do you want some life in your eyes? She wanted, it, they're not even going to be your life. It's going to be the life, the gift of God that stirred up. Christmas Day stirs up your faith. Did it stir up your faith? Amen. Proverbs 29, verse 1. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof. Now, the emphasis is on the word suddenly. Will suddenly be broken. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken without medicine. Beyond remedy means there'll be nothing you can do for him. Nothing. But the word hardened, 7185, it means somebody, just go to it, it's horrible, 7185, 7185. <laughs> now, just have a look at this, it's terrible. Yeah, hardened his neck. Because look what it means, Rodney. It means to be dense, to be tough or severe, to be cruel, to be fiercer, to make grievous, to be stiff-necked. So we're saying we're to have a neck that's adorned with battle scars. But can you see that, Corsuk? Um, to be dense, to be tough or severe, to be cruel. But this is what they say. Hold him. No, listen to who this is. If you listen it, to who this is in a minute. It's uh, one of our great known preachers of uh, many years, thousands of years ago, well, hundreds of years ago. And it says this. This is, actually means, it could read, a man of reproofs. It's a man who takes upon himself to be a censor of others and yet does those very things he's censoring in others himself. Isn't that terrible? He's not talking about you getting it wrong. It's somebody who's setting themselves up to um, reproof others, takes upon himself to be a censor of others. You're not doing that right. You shouldn't be doing this and yet does these things himself. And the emphasis upon this word is that it will suddenly, he will suddenly be broken without remedy, without medicine. Isn't that a scary thing? And I didn't actually know that, um, and I was just studying that last night. Isn't that amazing? We are want eyes that have got life in them. But the sad thing is without the understanding of God's word, You'll be deceived into thinking when fear comes, it is, it's either you or it's the Lord's will to frighten you. It's never fear, it's never from God. And the answer is to have a good understanding of his word. From today, when Christ um, looks at his bride, what does he see around her neck? Shields. And what do shields mean? You've been in a battle. You've been in a battle. You're in a battle for truth every day. But those battles bring about a beauty in our lives.